Picture London's Covent Garden as the slum it was before it was bustling with restaurants and tourists. Then imagine a narrow, winding street nearby, teeming with taverns, illicit booksellers, renowned thieves, and even the residents of America's first multi-millionaire. Now picture it all flattened in the name of modernization, as if it never existed. This is the story of Witch Street, London's forgotten gem. If you ask anyone familiar with London about the area known as Oldwich, they will probably picture the distinctive letter D that jumps off the map. Those with a little more local knowledge may imagine the abandoned tube stop that we see in so many Hollywood movies, or even the magnificent Bush House that used to be the headquarters of the BBC. What very few consider, however, is that just over a hundred years ago, the busy passers-by in this bustling through fair would have been strolling down what was described by contemporaries as one of London's most beautifully picturesque medieval walkways. Streets that were revered for centuries by the lower and upper classes alike, for the eclectic mix of entertainment and creative culture. It was the area that would serve as the inspiration for Charles Dickens' Bleak House. Having worked in Oldwich for years, I'd have to consider myself to be in that bracket of the blissfully unaware locals, who assume that the big grand buildings and the iconic curved road have long been this way. In fact, it was only in 1901 that the Old Witch Street, from which Old Witch derives its name, was demolished to make way for a more modern street plan in quite an important part of the city for transport. Starting at the surviving St. Clement Danes Church, ignoring the blitz bombing damage on the side, and looking towards where Australia House stands today, we'd have seen the road split into Hollywell Street on the left and Witch Street on the right, where the latter continues on to meet the southern end of Drury Lane and Covent Garden. And it would have been a great deal rougher than it is today. In place of Australia House stood a famous inn named The Rising Sun from 1856, and before that it was known as The Crooked Bullet, at which time it was well known for having a couple of bar wenches belt out a filthy verse or two outside on a Saturday night to the great amusement of the passers-by. This would have been a landmark inn at the time, and it's said that here at least one famous duel took place in this open space in the frontage, around the late 1600s, with two gentlemen arguing over the affections of a lady they'd met that night in a Fleet Street tavern. Wandering around the immediate area today, one present day tavern stands out as an establishment that the locals of Whip Street might have been familiar with. The George Inn was established in 1723 as a coffee house and boasted patrons such as English Dictionary founder Samuel Johnson, who used to use the pub as his postal address. It was also used by a renowned con man, Henry Perfect, who would regularly rent rooms upstairs while he took care of his business. Born to a clerical family, he would often impersonate a vicar and con punters out of their money. And with a name like Henry Perfect, who could ever suspect? Continuing on to Witch Street in the 18th and 19th century, we would notice how the narrow street was darkened by rows of Elizabethan houses, whose upper floors jetted out onto every tier. Indeed, this area survived the Great Fire of London of 1666 and gives us an idea of what pre-fire London might have looked like. Fortunately for us, photography was in full flow by the time the streets were demolished, so that we can have a rare glimpse of what literary icons such as Charles Dickens, Samuel Johnson, and Samuel Pepys would have seen as they frequented the area's coffee houses during their lifetimes. Had we taken a left at the Rising Sun, onto Hollywell Street, the literary connection is continued. It was a street that played host to many trades over the years, but none more renowned than its illicit bookshops, selling everything from pornographic materials to illegal religious texts of the heretical persuasion. It's not hard to imagine that there would have been some colourful characters frequenting the local taverns after a spot of shopping. In the space between Hollywell and Whit Street was one of London's medieval inns of chancery, named Lion's Inn. We're of course speaking about institutions of law as opposed to those of ale, where barristers would board and learn their trade. The only surviving inn of chancery is to be found on High Holborn, and it stands as one of the few pre-fire black and white buildings in the area. In fact, just across the road from Lyons Inn, on which street would have been the entrance to the new inn, famously connected to Sir Thomas More's education 
before he became Henry VIII's High Chancellor, and of course his eventual demise by the Executioner's Axe. By 1732, the grand buildings of Lion's Inn were already considered to be but small and old, and by the 19th century, Lion's Inn had been described as being degenerated into a haunt for all kinds of men about town, good and bad, clever and rascally, gamblers and swindlers. A historian considered that the whole area of narrow courts between Witch Street and Hollywell Street had witnessed scenes of the most disgraceful and infamous character. Considering that this area of London led onto the famous Victorian slums of St Giles Rookery and the Seven Dials, it paints a Dickensian scene of dark crooked streets, hiding all kinds of illicit behaviours. One contemporary account said of Witch Street in 1878, that it occurs to us that the narrow, dark and irregular alleyways in which the neighbourhood of Clare Market and Witch Street, encumbered as they were, with low projecting eaves, arched doorways and bulkheads, must have afforded every facility a century ago, or even less, for the unforeseen attacks of footpads and for the escape of the offenders, and even now it's almost as true as it was a century ago. Then it's only fitting that this area became popular with pickpockets and thieves, and none more famous than Jack Shepherd, or Honest Jack, who stalked these streets from 1702 to 1724. Becoming a celebrity thief in his day, written pages that told of his exploits flew off the shelves as he captured the public's imagination with his boyish looks and uncanny ability for an escape from the most unbelievable of scenarios. And Mr. Harrison Ainsworth even penned a novel showcasing his capers, almost glorifying the working class hero. Before turning to crime, Jack was taken on as a carpenter's apprentice near the new inn by the aptly named Mr. Owen Wood and he was a promising apprentice at that. It was at the Black Lion Tavern, which once stood where Witch Street met Drury Lane, that Jack met his lover, a prostitute known as Edgeworth Bess. And he was quickly welcomed into the underworld by such notorious thieves as Blueskin and the gang leader Jonathan Wilde. In Jack's own words, he states that it was Bess who led him into a life of crime, and the Black Lion was something of a regular haunt for all four, amongst many other criminals. The things we do for love. Jack went on to meet his end at Tyburn Gallows after trying his luck one too many times. It's said that Bess had a plan to rescue his dying body from the gallows and have a doctor resuscitate him. Alas, his fame had drawn crowds too big to get his body out in time. Pure theatre. Speaking of theatre, which street was known for entertainment and had several venues? A theme that's been carried on today in Oldwich. The Globe Theatre, the third of five to bear the name of Shakespeare's iconic stage, was built on the site of the former Lion's Inn, which had been demolished in an attempt at early gentrification. Opposite was the Shakespeare's Head, another tavern, and the meeting place of the so-called Club of Owls. They were named this because of the late hours kept by its members. Mark Lemon, editor of Punch, lived upstairs for a year too. Just down the street, there was another renowned theatre, known as the Olympic Theatre, built in 1806 on the site of the old Drury House. It was said to be built from the timbers of the French warship Ville de Paris during the Napoleonic Wars. On the subject of entertainment, it was at number 26 Witch Street that America's first multimillionaire, John Astor, lived and worked with his brother at their music shop, with close ties to John Broadwood and Sons, the piano maker still in business today. Sadly, rather than making his fortune in music, it was mainly in a fur trade monopoly and smuggling opium into China that John Astor prospered, a turn of trade that fits in with the narrative of Witch Street somehow. Among the numerous theatres of Witch Street resided the legendary music hall performer Arthur Lloyd, who lived at 39 in 1892. The list of notable residents goes on. For all its beauty and historic significance, Witch Street had become run down by the turn of the century, and its small windy roads deemed unsuitable for the modern flow of traffic. Victorian London hadn't yet taken on the idea of listed buildings, and had for some time been routing the surrounding areas to clear the notorious slums, and Witch Street, while culturally significant and popular among all classes, sat between the growing metropolis of Westminster and the City of London. 
By 1901, most of the area had been demolished as the carriageway known as Kingsway drove a line between business-focused Hoburn and vibrant Covent Garden, a divide so successful that it still holds true today. While the city grows and changes on a daily basis, it's hard not to lament the loss of the through fair that witnessed so much and meant even more to the lives that have come before us. The experiences of the everyday Georgian and Victoria Londoner to the extraordinary lives of those that have gone down in history. I'm glad to have discovered this little known ghost of London's recent past and to have shared a brief tour with you today. I'm back from a brief hiatus to do more historic discovering, so please do like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.